Um, so, hello everyone. I thought it would be a good thing to go back to the European continent as we've been spreading our ideas all around the globe. And specifically, I want to touch upon Eastern Europe that is this sort of um, paradox of inclusion and exclusion that um, it's sort of nearby, but it's always being overstepped in our uh, analysis. So, um, basically, my presentation is going to consists not really of three parts, but it's sort of because of this conference that is very interdisciplinary, I thought that it might not be a good idea of being overly specialized in the terminology I'm going to use or the thoughts that I'm going to put forward. And I rather wanted to, you know, put on the table things that I think are important for this region. And let's talk about it. So in the first sort of part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about um, political and philosophical underpinnings that uh, I've seen in um, the way the Eastern Europe has been conceptualized and specifically starting from the Enlightenment up until now. It was actually my undergrad thesis. And I'm going to point to you these philosophical conceptions, uh, but specifically pointing at how we can, the effect that they have in today's policy making in the EU and Russia. And so by doing this, I'm going to show conception of borders in the EU and Russia. Um, and throughout this sort of uh, talk on, on, on border conception and philosophical conceptualization behind actual foreign policy making, I would like you to think about the fact that we do make this uh, methodological error of applying the same conception that are derived by our sort of uh, historical experiences and then sort of apply them to regions that might have had idiosyncratic differences. And the example that I'm going to put forward is nation state, for instance. So nation state in, you know, post-colonial constructivist literature is being very much, um, you know, criticized as a black box that we're applying to realities that are, um, you know, have had a completely different historical experience. But... In the case of Eastern Europe, I'm going to put forward the maybe slightly controversial idea or what might seem as a controversial idea to this audience, but the fact that for this geopolitical region, the establishment of borders is actually not an act of violence but an act of liberation because that historic experience is a historic experience where the lack of borders is what did not allow certain uh, social political groups uh, or political identity to emerge. And finally, I'm going to actually uh, get less abstract and talk about the actual EU enlargement and what is European neighbourhood policy that actually is separated into branches, Eastern partnership to the Eastern neighbours and Euro-Mediterranean Union towards Southern neighbours. And of course, these are very, very complex foreign policy frameworks. And uh, although now I'm... I've worked very sort of in depth on the criticism of this policy, but this is not going to be the goal of, of the, my presentation. I'm happy to address some of the obvious uh, criticism against this policy framework uh, during Q&A. Uh, but actually what interests me here and to present to you is the potential spatial uh, reconceptualization that such a policy has opened for how we conceive space. Uh, so... You know, uh, let's start this talk with, I think that you've seen this video. Uh, it was sort of uh, pretty famous. But this is just to give an idea of how borders have changed on the European continent. We forget about this. But this is precisely reality. And this is a millennium of how borders in Europe have been changed. And if you notice, what we today call Eastern Europe has undergone much more radical changes. And so these are like throughout a thousand years. But if I even move forward, you see how they keep changing. And this is all somehow underpinning our ideas of national identity and political borders. And one of my favorite points, which is actually a tragic historical moment, but the end of the 18th century, look at Poland now, look closely, it disappeared because at the end of the 18th century uh, it was completely separated between the uh, Prussia, Austria and Russia and 
So you keep going on, keep going on, you go to the war wars and how it's completely changing. And now they call it Soviet Union. Soviet Union, Ukraine was not existing. The Baltic states had been occupied, Nazi and Soviet Union. And this is already second half. So this was just to give you an idea of the fact that like Ukraine today isn't, for instance, an um, independent country, but it's sort of, it, you know, depending if you're considering Turkey, it's a candidate country to the EU. No, it's controversial. Uh, some people, you know, divide Russia as what is towards Euros, its European territory, and otherwise not. But basically, it's one of the biggest um, European countries in terms of geographical size, and it's always been somehow um, overlooked, and I find this very fascinating. Um, so, borders. Uh, of course, like, we use this as a blanket term. Uh, and to address sociological ideas or political ideas or cultural identitarian ideas. But I'm interested in the sort of shift of how boundaries become borders. And so any sort of collective identity, it's sort of based on social cultural boundaries that matter when they actually get the weight of political borders. Because when we use certain discourses to justify a certain arrangement, this is what actually is at the base of all the geopolitical games. And if I were to problematize this assumption, that what's interesting is what happens when there are alternative narrations, alternative discourses that claim that lay put on the table equally sort of um, legitimate claims of a certain political, cultural, socio-economic arrangement over another. Um, so let me... Uh, uh, sort of address uh, what I have found out as European conception of borders, external, internal, in terms of um, a sort of inward looking or inward definition of what borders are and an external or outward one. Uh, so uh, my undergrad thesis, for instance, um, was, um, well, this is like sort of uh, the typical us other uh, conceptualization throughout time, but there's a very interesting book uh, by um, um, a Stanford uh, professor, American, Larry Wolf, who basically wrote this book, uh, Inventing the Concept of Eastern Europe. And his thesis was that um, the philosoph during the Enlightenment, uh, it was the time when wh what we call Western Europe has actually um, came up with the idea of establishing this um, um, sort of strategy of, of Western superiority, whether through the economic system, the political um, form of government, uh, or cultural identity. And in order to do that, you know, like traditionally, um, Western Europe has been sort of, you know, like any definition of Western Europe has been countervailed to another one, whether like the Asia, so like throughout the ancient times, with like ancient Greek literature, it's always like the other, that is something to the East. And if you look, for instance, at the Renaissance, it's very interesting how um, the concept of barbarian, the other, for instance, was coming from the North. So you read Machiavelli and the whole call for all Europeans to go and protect Italy. It was the barbarians, the Germans, the, 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 the Saxon, whatever. And Voltaire, who is actually, so we're going to the, to the Enlightenment, he was actually the man who had a massive influence in shifting common sense ideas of what we conceive as other in, in Western ideology, in the sense that the axiological, the value system, was no longer, again, north-south, but was west-east. And now there are different authors saying, well, but now with the European enlargement to the east, in the second half of the, of, uh, of, oh, in 2004 and seven, well, it's no longer relevant this one because, well, you know, we have just a bunch of countries to the east. And so again, in, in, in a socioeconomic terms, it's again, you know, the um, southern countries who are indebted and, and the southern, um, northern countries. So you see how they keep shifting and, and we not always have the analytical tools that can uh, predict these shifts. And so I always try to sort of try to be unbiased in, in, in trying to depict these border conceptions. So I'm trying at least to look at 
positive and negative uh, inheritances that we have from these discourses. From, from the Enlightenment, that is this crucial point in history in which the concept of Eastern Europe was born, uh, it is this mission civilisatrice, so this patronising idea of West being superior, superior and knowing the ingredients that make a successful policy. And we see this in today's European uh, neighbourhood policy or the conditionality-based policy as it is called towards the East. So when um, uh, the EU enlarged to, in 2004 and seven towards Eastern European countries, so basically it was 10 uh, post-communist countries, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, the three Baltic states, um, who am I missing, uh, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, I'm missing someone, but um, the, 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 the idea was that basically, so Western European countries now have the model, and so the conditionality-based policy was based on the idea of, called carrot and stick, so if you do what the EU says, and so you fulfill the so-called Copenhagen criteria, which means basically you have to fulfill the rule of law and democratic governance and be capable of, of support um, economic, um, um, uh, economic liberalization and you, you know, embrace the ideas and values of the European Union, well, then you can be a member state. Um, but this has been very much framed in terms of asymmetrical terms because the bargaining terms were not up for bargain. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about a, li a, a little bit later is what is European neighbourhood policy, which is basically it's extended to the post-eastern uh, enlargement to the east and south, where's the map, that basically includes all the new neighbours, and the idea was to, well, reframe the idea of, of neighbour, of, you know, of, of whatever neighbouring country, and so the goal was to create a new circle of friends, although given uh, the outcome of the Arab Spring and the current war between Ukraine and Russia, there are some also saying, well, the, the outcome has been rather like a circle of fire rather than a circle of friends. Um, so, going back to the Enlightenment, um, this is actually uh, interesting. Uh, this is um, well, what, what Wolf calls the paradox of simultaneous inclusion and exclusion because it was whether we read literature throughout the last 300 years or philosophical treaties or even the underlying discourse in, in policy making, Eastern Europe has always been sort of, ah, it's not Asia, ah, it's not Western Europe, so what is it? And even uh, so, Wolf quotes uh, a Winston Churchill's. Uh, um, speech and, and he says that the, the Iron Curtain was drawn on the maps of the mind. So what we call, like in historical or geopolitical terms, the Iron Curtain was actually embedded in how our neurons work much sooner. And this idea then has been reiterated as a pedagogical convenience, because, which is basically what we have been addressing but towards different regions. Uh, in the world, but the, the real threat of these black boxes or, um, or sort of invented terms is the pedagogical convenience in reiterating ideas that then are very difficult to get rid of. Because whether, you know, like for, for the era that I'm studying, post-Soviet, post-communist, uh, it's all post, 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 and it's not inventing anything new. And so we uh, have the goal of overcoming some uh, previous um, theoretical goals that we no longer agree with, but the analytical tool that we're using are actually uh, outdated. So um, after the uh, Enlightenment, there has been the opposite reaction of not having these universalizing projects, but rather these more inward-looking ones. And so looking at the model of Romanticism, and it's interesting looking at both uh, Western European authors, but also Polish, Ukrainian, also Russian, and so of course in, co in common they have this uh, negative essentialization of identities. But at the same time, the output of this that we see in the UN Charter and Helsinki Agreements is a certain conception that after World War II, you do need the conception of territorial integrity and political sovereignty because, as I'm going to show afterwards, but the Crimean annexation shows you that when there's the disrespect of this, so it's, you know, in an academic room, it's very easy to 
debate to what extent these conceptions can be challenged, but in international law and international relations, when you have to deal with partners who might be signatories of certain international treaties, and then in the actual behavior do not com you know, uh, um, comply with these. How do you do? So you need some limitations. Um, Russian conception of borders. Well, this is a very complex um, ideology, so I'm not going to go into details. But basically, the fundamental idea is that Russia is an identity, uh, has an identity that uh, does not belong neither to Europe and nor to uh, Asia, and it's sort of this intercontinental um, entity that has this uh, perpetual um, enlargement potential and capacity. And, um, Interesting. Also, training. He is at uh, Chatham House and and Carnegie, and he uh, has this expression that basically, after the call of the Soviet Union, for instance, Russia had to accept Ukraine as a separate state, but not really as a foreign one. Which leads me to Russia's um, internal conception of borders. This is usually um, sort of boiled down to the idea of Ruski Wall, Ruski Mir, um, uh, which is basically this. Um, uh, homogenizing idea of the Slavic space, and this is very dangerous because, I mean, apart from all the academic talks, but I've been at the Euromaidan and I could see there was Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, people from all faiths coming and praying together, and so these talks about identity sort of started getting on the sides because the common cause was something more important, and it was basically a cause against a sort of manipulation of the actual reality. And this is very dangerous in the current Russian propaganda because it's basically exploiting, um, well, even in cognitive science, Kahneman, the sort of Nobel Prize uh, psychologist, has this idea of cognitive ease. That means that we simplify uh, our addressing reality because we don't understand it by asking more simpler questions. And so this is the idea of Ukraine. Well, basically, there's a Western one that's pro-European and an Eastern one that's pro-Russian. Well, it's more complicated. So, um, well, I sort of already addressed the European neighborhood policy, so that's, that's fine. Um, so I just want to conclude by showing you a video uh, of how uh, mental maps and geographical maps do not always overlap. So basically this is the video um, of, at the beginning of the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, how uh, Italian newspapers does this tradition of you know, selling encyclopedias or atlases with uh, newspapers. And so basically, of course, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there are 20 new borders that have come up, so you need to uh, publish new, um, new borders. And so basically, uh, it's actually we talked about we talked about space, and that's going to be um, up to a point. So basically, the idea is there's this Soviet astronaut who went into space, and once he his um, uh, space shuttle had um, a, uh, an accident, it fell, but it was already a collapse of the Soviet Union. So he lands, same, say, "Oh, Mother Russia," and there's a Ukrainian peasant who says, "What this? Yeah." So basically, uh, this is not Russia. This is Ukraine. And, and he goes like, no, but Russia is Ukraine. He said, like, no, Ukraine is Ukraine. The Czechoslovakia, Praga, no, Slovakia, Bratislava. So, um, yeah, basically that's it. Um, and so it's very interesting, the idea of how, um, you know, we have some ideas and then the maps change, but sometimes the map change and the ideas underlying do not change. And this is what's happening in the current post soviet conflicts. And so all these constructivist talk that sometimes part of the literature is about deterritorialization and globalization, but for instance, the research that I'm now doing is actually uh, addressing texts that, uh, that study all conflicts whereby the idea of territoriality or ethnic identity have not disappeared at all. This is what sort of thoughts I wanted to leave you with. Thanks.